Hello, curious people. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Curious People Wanted, a video series by the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut. My name is Adrienne St. Pierre, and in my role as curator of the Barnum Museum, I get to learn about the many fascinating artifacts and documents in our collection. I'm always on the lookout for things in other museum collections that are related to what we have. Um, and when my husband and I were vacationing in Canada this summer, that actually happened. We had decided to spend most of our time exploring Cape Breton Island, which is the eastern part of the province of Nova Scotia. One of the places we enjoyed visiting on Cape Breton was the small town of Bedeck, where Parks Canada has an outstanding museum devoted to the story of Alexander Graham Bell and his wife, Mabel Hubbard Bell, who built their beautiful home nearby. I bet the first thing that came to your mind when I said the name Alexander Graham Bell was his invention of the telephone. And I have here an example from our collection. Um, this one dates to probably the late 1870s, early 1880s. But uh, Bell lived and breathed invention. He was not a one and done kind of inventor. And he and his wife um, had wide ranging interests. So there's really a lot more to Alexander Graham Bell than the telephone. And I'm actually going to focus on a different invention um, that is directly connected to Bridgeport, Connecticut. I should add that the credit for this invention is not Bell's alone. It is heavily shared with a man named Charles Sumner Tainter, a brilliant scientist in his own right who was from Massachusetts. First, a super brief background about Bell. He was a Scottish man, um, born in Scotland, who emigrated to North America in 1870 when he was 23 years old. He came with his parents in large part to regain health, as they had real reason to fear death from tuberculosis. Alec, as he was called, was ill and suffering from the disease, though he was still working. But it had killed both his older and younger brothers. So the family settled on a farm near Brantford, Ontario, and luckily, Alec recovered. He was born into a family of people who were bright and inventive, and a lot of their efforts were devoted to understanding how humans speak, how we make speech, in order that they could teach deaf and mute people how to speak. So I think it is worth noting that the range of Bell's work concerned not only inventions that uh, advance technology, even extending to avi aviation, but also important humanitarian contributions that um, truly change individuals' lives. Well, Bell and Bridgeport, yes, there is a connection here, and, that's, um, and there's another inventor that I need to add to the mix as I um, tell you this story. That's Elias Howe, who was from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he was granted a patent for the first practical sewing machine. That was back in 1846. Now, here in Bridgeport, a significant part of our city's history from the 1850s well into the 20th century is about manufacturing and about manufacturing newly invented products, the sewing machine, for example. Bridgeport's location um, with a good harbor and access uh, to the railway made it an ideal place for factories. And so it was that in the mid-19th century, um, Elias Howe came to Bridgeport and he eventually built a sewing machine factory here. This was exactly what P.T. Barnum wanted to see. Um, this was a young and developing city, and uh, Barnum was extremely interested himself in inventions and science. And he and Howe knew one another. Well, Howe was not new to, to this. He had been making sewing machines since the mid-1840s, but he'd had a lot of trouble for years with patent infringements, like with Isaac Singer, a name I'm sure you know. After that was finally settled um, in his favor, um, Howe decided that he needed a larger factory with uh, easier access to New York City. Um, Bridgeport's harbor, of course, as I said, made that uh, much um, more appealing. 
Um, he had competition, though. There was an, another sewing machine company in Bridgeport, notably Wheeler & Wilson, which grew to become the largest manufacturer of sewing machines in the world in the 19th century. Um, so there was that competition, and sadly, Howe died in 1867, um, only in his late 40s. Um, and that was right after his, um, his factory was built. Um, we have a print here of the Howe Machine Company factory um, when it was brand new and built in, in Bridgeport around 1866. That um, shows you the factory right next to the Pequannock uh, River. Um, there's a actually nicer one, a little cleaner looking, um, at the um, Huntington Library in San Marino, uh, California. So we'll show you that one. You can get the details. Howe's two son-in-laws kept the business going for another couple of decades after their father-in-law's death. But eventually, they decided to sell the sewing machine factory. And that's where Alexander Graham Bell and Charles Tainter step into the picture in Bridgeport. The newly formed company, called the American Graphophone Company, moved into the former Howe Machine Company. And that's where they would manufacture their product, which was a graphophone, a vast improvement over Edison's early phonograph. So that name, American Graphophone, quickly caught my attention when I was in the Bell Museum in Cape Breton. I did not expect to see something made in Bridgeport all the way up there. Um, kind of a remote, off the beaten tracks place. But there it was, in a display case, right in the center of a gallery, an early talking machine, <laughs> a graphophone mounted to a treadle sewing machine base. If you aren't familiar with early sewing machines, um, that is pre-electric sewing machines, take a look at this example we have from the Howe Machine Company. It's a beautiful uh, machine, rather decorative as well as functional, and it has patent dates on it of 1846, 1858, and 1867. Um, here is where there would have uh, been a, a little plaque, a medallion, the same one as you see on this little bit later Howe machine. It's actually a portrait of Elias Howe. Um, very nice, very nice little element. Um, but the part down below is what I wanted to show you. This is the treadle. And to make it work, you have to push your foot down on the treadle and release it, developing a kind of an even rhythm. And so this treadle is connected to this wheel, which would have a leather band that connected it to the um, main gear of the sewing machine. And the treadle is what made the wheels and gears turn. Well. At the Bell Museum, in the model they had of this American graphophone, you could see how the cast iron treadle had been redesigned and was painted to highlight the name American Graphophone Company. So that like, stopped me in my tracks. I knew this company had been in Bridgeport and that it had eventually become Columbia Records. And another branch became Dictaphone, um, producing yet another of Alexander Graham Bell's inventions. I couldn't spot Bridgeport anywhere on their sewing machine base or on the graphophone mounted to it, but I recognized the familiar design of a graphophone like one we have in the collection here. And I love the fact that this invention made use of the sewing machine, kind of a, a marriage of these products. It wasn't just a handy base uh, on which to plant that graphophone. It was also the mechanism that made the graphophone function, at least in its initial iteration. Now, this example from our collection dates to 1901. Um, there are several patent dates on it going back to the 1880s, but as 1901 is the latest, it dates from then or a bit later. So on this newer model, we have an advancement over the treadle machine method. Instead of using the treadle to turn the mechanism, there is a key here, kind of a fancy key, that you would wind up. Um, so this turns the mandrel here, which has a wax cylinder on it. And I'm told that it runs for about two minutes. Well, let me back up a second to explain how the graphophone came to be. First of all, the name graphophone distinguishes Bell and Tainter's invention from Thomas Edison's phonograph of 1877. 
Edison's first version of the phonograph was not that practical, and he kind of got pulled away to work on that little invention called the incandescent light bulb. Meanwhile, Bell and Tainter experimented with using wax cylinders instead of foil, and with a floating needle, we have that here, to an attach here, and that would actually cut the sound vibrations into the wax cylinder. Um, so they worked on this invention, and uh, just like sewing machines <laughs> use needles, uh, so did the graphophone, different kind, of course. Um, but it's interesting that they both ha share a needle as a key component. So Bell and Tainter received a patent for their invention in 1886. Um, and obviously, this is a much better way to produce a durable product. And the graphophone could both record sound on the wax cylinder uh, and replay the sound. Um, so in order to record, you'd have a little extra apparatus, a speaking tube um, that could then be um, detached and taken off, whatever, as, as needed. You can see how that worked in this diagram. This is from a graphic panel at the Bell Museum exhibition. So you see a gentleman sitting with that speaking apparatus. So all in all, this was a marketable product, something that could be used for business or for entertainment. Music or voice recordings were cut into wax cylinders that people could then purchase. And perhaps you've uh, sometimes seen little cardboard tubes like this in antique shops. Um, these contain the wax cylinders um, that you know, people would buy, collect, just kind of like buying a vinyl record. In fact, cabinets were made especially to hold people's collections of these wax cylinders, um, just as later on there would be cabinets designed to hold records. Well, to get back to the factory story, when the American graphophone took over the Howe factory in 1887, they had a lot of the same employees, which included cabinet makers and finishers. So their skills and the factory's production capabilities were easily adopted and transferred to the manufacture of graphophones. And, you know, like I said, the more you compare old sewing machines and the graphophones, the more similarities you see. Today, I guess we might call that adaptive reuse. And, you know, there are so many old factory buildings sitting empty in cities today that um, are awaiting <laughs> being uh, reused, you know, new, new life breathed into them. But they were humming in Bridgeport for a long, long time. And here in this photograph of Bridgeport, we get a glimpse of the factories in their heyday. At the, um, at the left here, um, alongside the banks of the Pequannock, you see a a wide brick building, and that is the American Graphophone Company, the same building we saw in the print, the former Howe Sewing Machine Factory. Um, you can't see the entire factory, but uh, you can see the sign uh, on it. And uh, so that's, that's kind of an exciting thing. I was actually scouting for a photo of the building, and I remembered we had this, this particular photo that includes the old factory buildings even though the focus is on the bridge. And um, this was taken when, when the bridge was, was brand new. It's a, a pivot span bridge that was constructed um, in Bridgeport. So what do we have on the bridge? A dense crowd of people, 12 elephants, and right in the center of the photograph, uh, none other than P.T. Barnum. <laughs> Of course, who else would be bringing elephants onto a bridge? So I love the fact that this photograph, in its way, illuminates the success of four famous people whose inventive minds were so connected to Bridgeport's history. Elias Howe, Alexander Graham Bell, Charles Tainter, and P.T. Barnum. For me, it was really exciting to discover a Bridgeport product, an important 19th century invention that was developed and manufactured here all the way up north on Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia. That was a surprise. I hope you enjoyed my summer vacation story and I will look forward to having you join me again for another episode of Curious People Wanted. 
In the meantime, stay curious and be inventive.